Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FE Bio Workshop. My name is Steve Maas. I am the lead software developer on the FE Bio project, and I am joined here today by Dr. Jeff Weiss, who's uh, from the University of Utah, and Dr. Gerard Ateshian, who joins us from Columbia University. They're both the PIs on the project, as well as contributors to FE Bio and uh, its supporting software packages. So we're very excited to be here at CMBB this year, and we hope that you will find this workshop very informative and helpful. So I'd like to start with giving a brief overview of the FE Bio project, mostly for those who may not be familiar with it yet. So after that, we'll jump into a demo on meshing, which um, is of course more general than FE Bio itself, but we decided to tackle this topic because it's something we haven't talked much about during previous webinars and workshops, even though it is of course a very important part of any finite element modeling pipeline. After that, uh, Dr. Teshin will take over and take you on a tour of some of the new and exciting features that are being developed in FE Bio. <clears throat> so let's start with a brief overview of FE Bio. So the FE Bio project started around 2005 when we and other researchers in the field kind of felt that there was a need for a finite element solver that was dedicated to the field of biomechanics. And with FE Bio, we tried to fill that need. At the time, we were mostly interested in uh, nonlinear solid mechanics and a little bit of mixtures. But over the years, FE Bio has grown into a true multi-physics code where you can combine not only nonlinear mechanics, but also mixtures, fluids, reactions, electrokinetics, and more. FE Bio supports a, a variety of boundary conditions and modeling scenarios that are useful in this field. But perhaps what sets FE Bio apart from other finite element codes is that we have a very large library of constitutive models that are focused on representing biological tissues. So I don't have to convince you that biological tissues can have very complex organizations and very complex behavior. But what we tried with FE Bio is to build a library of constitutive models that allows you to capture many of these complexities. And so with the constitutive models in FE Bio, you can model not only the traditional hyperelastic models, but also um, anisotropy, um, inhom inhomogeneity, viscoelasticity, growth, rem remodeling damage, and more. FEBio was also designed with the researcher in mind. So not only then, but even today, computational biomechanics is still an evolving field. And so we wanted to make it relatively easy for uh, researchers to implement new ideas and new constitutive models. And so we've done that on the one hand by providing FEBio as an open source software project where people can just download the code and we try to document uh, everything as best as we can so that none of it is a, is a black box. But on the other hand, we also implemented a plugin framework that makes it relatively easy to add new features to FE Bio. So when I speak of FE Bio, I'm usually referring to the, uh, the solver code itself, which is a separate standalone code, uh, which is a command line tool. Basically, it, it takes an input file, it solves the problem, and then it returns an output file. And so to facilitate the integration with, with FE Bio, we have also developed FE Bio Studio, which is a, a GUI-based environment that allows you to create, run, and then visualize and analyze FE Bio models. Now, this is all great, but of course, the big question is, um, is FE Bio being used by the community? Were we able to fill that need? And so over the years, we've tried to collect some statistics that gives us an idea of that. And just to give you a few numbers here, so we have over 60,000 downloads of the FE Bio software itself. So that does not include any of the supporting packages. We have a user space that is 12,000 uh, people strong on febio.org. And we are aware of over 500 publications that have used FE Bio. Um, including journal articles, PhD theses, and uh, book chapters. So to us, these numbers are very encouraging, but, but perhaps is even more encouraging is that these numbers are continuing to grow. We continue to grow our user base and our downloads. And so I think it's fair to say 
that Evie Bio has been welcomed by the community as a very useful and helpful tool for doing fine element simulations. So if you haven't used Evie Bio before, I hope that this convinces you to at least take a closer look and see if it might uh, address your computational modeling needs as well. So with that said, um, let's jump into a demo on meshing. So I'm going to open here FE Bio Studio. So as I mentioned, FE Bio Studio is the supporting software that allows you to create, uh, run, and visualize FE Bio models. And today we're only going to focus on one part of this, and that is the meshing part. So very often um, you'll have some kind of input geometry in, in very different formats, but it's not a finished fine element mesh yet. And so the question is, how do you turn that geometry into a finished fine element mesh that is ready for analysis? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider a few different use cases um, that might be relevant to you. So the first use case is where your geometry is just a surface mesh that you may have acquired by segmenting some image data. So you have a surface representation like an STL file that you would like to start um, by importing in FE Bio Studio and meshing it. So before we can do anything, we have to start a new model which pops up this dialog box. So if you have any particular analysis in mind, you could check uh, a template here. But in our case, since we're only gonna be focused on meshing, it's not that relevant. So we'll just pick structural mechanics. There's a few ways to import geometry into FE Bio Studio. So first of all, there is file import geometry. And on the bottom here, you can see that we support a variety of different file formats, including Abacus, ANSYS, LS Dyna, uh, and some more uh, general uh, mesh representation file formats. And so we'll stick to SDL here. So I'll open this example file, which shows a mesh of a bifurcated artery. So for those who are interested, uh, these files are available on our repository panel. So if you go to the repository panel and click on connect, you get access to our online database um, of FE Bio models. So in here, you'll find some user projects that uh, uploaded models that were used in certain publications and you'll have the publication information as well. You'll also find all of our test suite problems here, problems that are used in our tutorials, and then uh, models that we use in our webinars. And that's where you will find the models that we're using today. Okay, so the goal is now to mesh this artery. Now, the first thing you'll see is that this is an open surface mesh. It has these holes here, it's not capped at the end. So that's the first thing that we'll have to address. Usually you can only mesh a surface that is closed. So we have a couple tools that um, allow you to deal with this. Oh, I'm sorry. So if you open the build panel here and then um, click on the mesh tab. So the mesh tab is where you will find all the options to generate this mesh. But as I said, we can't do that right now because first we have to close these gaps. So to do that, we go to the edit tab. The edit tab tells us that this is an editable surface. And the editable surface means that you can make changes to this surface before you make any, uh, before you generate a mesh. Now there's a few options here and we're not going through all of them, but I will demonstrate a few of them. And the first one is the fix mesh tool. So very often, um, you know, you'll have a mesh that has, that has small problems like some holes in it or some duplicate faces or some other minor issues that may not prevent you from rendering the model, but it will, it will prevent you from generating a finite element mesh. And so we have a few tools here that can help with that. And in particular, the fill hole tool is the one that we're gonna use here because that tool allows us to cap these ends very easily. 
Now the mesh that this generated is not ideal. And so we have a couple other tools that you can use to create a better mesh on these caps here. The tool we use for that is the MMG remesh tool. So MMG is a third party library that we use for a variety of different meshing um, uh, purposes. And what we'll use it here for is to remesh these facets here. Now, the first thing we need to do is get an idea of the element size that we'd like to use. So there's a few different ways you can find information on that um, in FE Bio Studio, and I'll show a few as we go through this, uh, just a demo. And the first one I wanna show is the tools, the measure toolbox here, All right? So the measure toolbox gives you uh, a variety of tools that allows you to measure distances, angles, areas, and so forth. So in this case, we'll use the point distance tool. So all we have to do is select these two nodes and it'll tell us the distance between these two nodes. So we'll just copy that and paste that here in the element size. And then we turn off remesh selection only, click on that, and we have a much better mesh. Now, as you may have noticed, this didn't only mesh these ends, but it actually remeshed the entire surface. If I go back and forward here, um, you kind of see that we are remeshing the entire surface, which may not be what we want. So let's try this again uh, and remesh only these surfaces here. So the way to do that is by clicking here on the face selection tool. And if we click on any of these faces here, you'll see it selects the face. Now, how do we select the entire surface? So there's a few different ways and the easiest way is just select here the select connected option. So if I click now on any of these faces, it's, it's going to select not only that face, but all the other faces that are connected to it and whose normal is less than 30 degrees with the normal of the first selected face. So now if I remesh here and I check the only remesh selection option, it's only gonna remesh this part without affecting the rest of the mesh. So let's use that now also for meshing these other surfaces. Okay, so now that we have a closed mesh, we can start meshing this, uh, this surface. Now, sometimes you bring in a mesh and it's already closed. So how do you know it's really a closed surface mesh as opposed to a volumetric mesh? And again, there's a few tools in FE Bio that, uh, in FE Bio Studio that you can use for that. And the first tool I wanna demonstrate here is the plane cut tool. So the plane cut just simply cuts through the mesh and allows you to see the inside. And as you can see, the inside is just hollow. So there is no volumetric elements in there yet. Okay, so let's go ahead and mesh this surface. So on the mesh panel, we can choose the meshing method and there's only two options at this point, which is TetGen. TetGen is another third party library that we use for some of our meshing algorithms. Uh, the other option is shell mesh. So sometimes you just wanna generate a shell from a surface and so you would just click shell mesh. In this case, we are gonna create that real element. So we stick the TetGen. Now, if we don't change any of these options, then uh, TetGen will generate a mesh based on some default quality uh, uh, metrics. So let's start with the default and click on apply. The mesh was generated, but visually not much has changed. So how do we know that we now have a volumetric mesh? Well, if we activate our plane cut tool, we now see that we do have elements on the inside and I can show it even better by using the hide elements option here. So now we have elements on the inside. Now, what you do notice is that these elements are fairly big. Uh, the inside elements even look bigger than the ones on the surface. Now, again, that's because we didn't specify an element size here. So if we wanna have a more uniform mesh, we can do that by just specifying an element size. So we'll just choose that same value that we used previously. Click on apply. And now we have a more uniform mesh. Okay, so that kind of showcases the first uh, use case where you start from a surface, 
you repair or fill holes, and then you go to uh, the, the volumetric meshing. The second use case we'll consider is what if we already have a volumetric mesh? So if I now import geometry, there's another file here, VTK, which is a volumetric mesh. And again, how do you know that, that this is a volumetric mesh? Again, you can use the plane cut tool, but another and perhaps more uh, useful way is by clicking on the mesh inspector here. So if I click on the mesh inspector, it opens this dialog box. And what it tells us here, it gives us basically a breakdown of this mesh. And in this table here, you can see that we only have four noted tetrahedral elements. Like if you had different kinds of elements uh, in this mesh, then they would show up in this table as well, but now we only have four noted tetrahedral meshes. So even though we already have a mesh, uh, sometimes it is useful to do uh, a remeshing of this mesh. Sometimes the mesh that we import is either too coarse or it is too fine, or we need some refinement in certain areas. So we do have a few options here that allows us to make some changes to these meshes. So notice that when FEBio pulls in this volumetric mesh, it made it an editable mesh. Just like the editable surface, the editable mesh means that you can change anything about the mesh. Now in this case, what I'll only uh, demonstrate is um, how we can do some remeshing. So one thing we'd like to do uh, sometimes in the case of you know, fluid analysis or biphasic analysis is create a boundary layer. And I'll show two ways of making a boundary layer. First, Let's use the same MMG remesh tool here. And what we'd like to do is basically refine the elements near the, the outer surface of this structure. First thing we'll have to do is we'll have to select all the elements on the outside. And I have my select connected here. So if I click on that, it'll select a lot of elements, but apparently not all of them yet. So we can grow these selections by either shift clicking on other parts. We also have some shortcuts like Control Plus that allows you to create uh, or grow the selection. Or perhaps more easily, we can just increase this angle criteria to say 180, and that allows us to select the entire surface with one click. Okay, so now that we have the surface selected, we can specify a new element size for that surface and we'll go with 003 and we'll also increase the gradation which tells um, MMG how quickly it can go from a fine to a coarse mesh. And then if we click on apply, and this will take a few seconds. Um, so there's a lot of other options that you can do to, um, you know, create a better mesh or, or to make changes to your mesh, you can specify a minimum element size. Uh, this house door value relates to how accurate MMG is going to uh, mesh around curved surfaces. And as you can see here, we've created a finer mesh on the boundary and uh, we retain the bigger elements on the inside. So let me show the plane cut tool so we can see that a little bit better here. Okay, so this is one way of creating um, a boundary layer. Let me go back to our original mesh and let me show you another tool, another uh, tool for generating a boundary layer tool here. So the boundary layer tool will kind of grab the, the last row of elements uh, next to the boundary and divide these up based on the settings here to create a boundary layer. So let's set that to 1.5 and let's set it to five segments. If I now click apply, you'll see that this tool has generated uh, a boundary layer for this mesh. So that's another scenario. So a third scenario, perhaps the most not, uh, not commonly used one, but uh, still very relevant in certain application. And that is the import of CAT geometry. So we support a few different CAD formats. So at this point, it's BREP and step file. So let me import this, uh, this simple step file here. And so this comes in as a CAD file. If you now go to your build panel and 
um, your mesh tab. So I'll just say it's just an object, it's just a generic object. And um, it gives you uh, a basic mesh generator, which is based on <clears throat> NetGen, which is another library that we use for some of our meshing. So you can just quickly generate um, a mesh for that with a click of a button. You can change some of these settings to create finer or coarser meshes. And once you have a mesh generated, you have some tools to do some additional remeshing. So for instance, you can use that same MMG remesh tool to create And so you can see you can make modifications of the mesh. You also have the boundary layer tool. Um, if you're not happy with the mesh, you can of course undo all your changes or you can just regenerate the mesh from scratch. So the other thing I wanna talk about quickly is about um, second order tetrahedral elements. So, so far, all the meshes that were generated are linear tetrahedral elements. Now, uh, linear element tetrahedral elements are um, they're very popular because it's relatively easy to generate meshes. However, it's important to understand that linear tetrahedral elements are usually best avoided when doing nonlinear fine element analysis. And so there's a few ways that you can convert your, um, your linear, linear elements into quadratic higher order elements. <clears throat> And so the, the NetGen measure actually supports this directly. So you can just generate a higher order um, element mesh. Now, how do you know this is a higher order element mesh? Well, you can, for instance, show the nodes. You'll see that it has nodes on the edges, which is very typical of higher order elements. Or um, you can show the mesh inspector, which will now tell us that these are 10 noted tetrahedral elements. Now, this was done using directly with NetGen. Well, what if we um, import a linear tetrahedral mesh. So let's just convert this to an editable mesh. Let's say that we imported this mesh. We have a convert tool that allows you to convert linear tetrahedral meshes to uh, different types of higher order um, tetrahedral meshes. Okay, so hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of the, the meshing capabilities we currently have in FE Bio Studio. Now, I've only shown tetrahedral meshes, but I want to emphasize that FEBio and FEBio Studio also support many different types of elements, including hexahedral and tetrahedral and pentahedral elements and some higher order variation of these elements. Uh, we just don't have a lot of automatic meshing algorithms for, uh, for this in FEBio Studio yet. But if you have a hexahedral element mesh or, or any kind of different element mesh, FEBio Studio will usually read it in. Um, so, okay, so at this point, I would like to give uh, the presentation to Dr. Ateshian. Thank you, Steve. Um, I will take over and um, summarize some of the features that have been added. Um, Steve, you need to enable my screen sharing. So um, what I'm going to talk about um, is the first feature that uh, Steve mentioned, which is you know, the feature related to uh, frictional biphasic contact. In order to discuss frictional biphasic contact, I'm just going to briefly review uh, what is a biphasic material. So, a biphasic material is the mixture approach for modeling pore elasticity, porous media that are deformable with interstitial fluid flow. So we implemented biphasic materials in FEBio in 2006. And then we implemented a frictionless contact of biphasic materials in 2010. And what you see here, for example, is contact in a knee joint between the patella and the femur. This is the contact stress or also the third uh, minimum principal stress. This is the fluid pressure. And the, you know, when you load the biphasic material, the fluid pressurizes and the fluid flows according to Darcy's law. So these arrows here show the uh, fluid flux. But uh, in order to understand uh, frictional uh, contact, we need to kind of review a little bit of the physics of a biphasic material. And we're going to focus on the physics of articular cartilage because that's the example that I'm taking here. And the, it's the 
um, example for which we have experimental data. So here's um, a piece of cartilage which can be placed in a confining uh, chamber like that. So you place that disc at the bottom here and we're gonna load it with this indenter here with this actuator and we're gonna measure the total load that's being applied using this load cell, but we're also gonna measure the fluid pressure in the cartilage using this MEMS pressure transducer. So when you do these kinds of experiments, you confirm that in fact, let's say you do a creep analysis. So you, you apply a constant load and when you divide the load by the cross-sectional area, you get what we call the total stress. So you apply a constant you know, stress and what you find is that initially the fluid pressure is gonna match the stress that you apply. And this is just due to experimental you know, approximations of a one dimensional problem. And then the fluid pressure over time is actually gonna subside and go to zero. So this is the experimental confirmation of the underlying porous media mechanics that we assume occurs in articular cartilage, namely that the fluid pressure rises when you load it, but as the fluid flows out of the cartilage, the fluid pressure goes down to zero. Now in our frictional biphasic contact algorithm, we're gonna take the ratio of the fluid pressure to the total stress. And we're gonna call that the fluid load support. So you see it here, the load that's supported by the fluid pressure, take the fluid pressure multiplied by the cross-sectional area divided by the total load. And in the case of confined compression, the theoretical maximum is 100%, but eventually it goes down to zero. So if you run a friction analysis on a piece of cartilage, by also simultaneously measuring the fluid pressure in the tissue. And you have here a multi-axial load cell that allows you to measure the horizontal force, which is the friction force and the vertical force, which is the normal applied force. When you run an experiment like this, here's what you get for the friction coefficient. You find that the friction coefficient is not constant and increases over time. So because it's not a constant, we call it the effective friction coefficient. So we put the subscript mu effective. But since we're able to measure the fluid load support, the ratio of the fluid pressure to the applied load at the same time, what we notice is that when the friction is very low, that's also the case when the fluid load support is very high, it's almost equal to one. And then as the fluid load support approaches zero, then the friction coefficient seems to approach a steady state value, which we call mu equilibrium. So this type of phenomenon is the characteristic frictional response of a biphasic material if you take the friction coefficient mu effective and you plot it parametrically against the fluid load support, so you eliminate time as a variable, you see the data points fall in a very nice curve that's almost a straight line. So this has motivated us to uh, formulate a constive model for the frictional response of a biphasic material. Remember, this is the friction coefficient here. When the fluid load support is low, when it's close to zero, the friction coefficient is high. When the fluid load support is high, the friction coefficient is low. So you, you know, we proposed a linear relationship between the friction coefficient and the fluid load support. When the fluid load support reduces to zero, this entire term goes away. And so the friction coefficient is equal to this equilibrium friction coefficient. But when the fluid load support approaches the theoretical maximum of 100%, this becomes equal to this coefficient phi times the equilibrium friction coefficient. That gives you the minimum friction coefficient, this low value that you see here. So phi is the solid on solid contact area fraction because you have a porous material on one side and in this particular experiment, you have a glass side on the other side. So if you fit, if you actually do a linear regression um, of this equation to this experimental data, you get this solid line here, you predict that the solid on solid contact area fraction is about 11%. And if you actually measure the water content of the cartilage experimentally, you find that it's actually the water content is 90%, which means the solid uh, volume fraction. And so the solid area fraction is equal to 10%. So this is therefore, you know, if you want the experimental validation of the friction model that we implemented in FEBI. So the original frictionless contact algorithm already took into account that when you load your cartilage uh, surfaces together, the fluid will pressurize in the loaded area, but outside of the loaded area, we assume that there's ambient conditions. So that was like the main contribution of this 2010 paper, which dealt with frictionless contact. And this year, we just published a paper that now introduces frictional contact based on the friction model that I showed you a moment ago. Now, let me show you a couple of problems where we compared the experimental data that you saw. This is the friction coefficient. This is the fluid load support. We replicated this particular experiment on FEBIO, 
And in this particular case, we're sliding at one millimeter per second, the one plus or minus one millimeter translation range under a constant load of three newtons. And if we actually run this simulation on Fe bio, we see that the friction coefficient rises over time as at the same time as the fluid load support decreases. So this is a confirmation of how Fe bio is able to replicate the experimental data. But it's not just under constant load. We can actually replicate other experiments. So the same student here who conducted the previous study also did a subsequent study where he applied a dynamic load. Um, so it's a cyclical load that goes from a low value to a high value back to the low value cyclically. And the experimental friction response here is very interesting. It shows that there's a lower envelope and an upper envelope for the friction coefficient. Um, the lower envelope is very similar to what we saw under a constant load before, but the upper envelope is a very high friction coefficient of about 0.5. So when you run the simulation, you actually find out that the fluid pressure becomes negative in a portion of the cycle. You see this dark blue color here, uh, the fluid pressure becomes negative, which means it becomes subatmospheric, which means that there is going to be suction. And during that portion of the cycle, when there is suction between the glass slide and the cartilage, the friction coefficient goes up. And that's what the experiment shows. And when you run this on FeBio, you see the same envelope, which is very nice. It kind of shows you that FeBio, the implementation of the friction algorithm, is doing what we see in our experimental results. So this covers the part that I wanted to discuss about the biphasic friction, which is a new feature that was implemented in FeBio. Now I wanna talk about biphasic fluid structure interactions. That's the, the other feature that was introduced this year. And in order to talk about it, I first have to remind you that we started implementing computational fluid dynamics in 2018 in FeBio. So basically you're doing the dynamic uh, flow of a viscous fluid. There's nothing biphasic here, it's just a viscous fluid. So here, this is just a demonstration of channel flow a flow over a narrow channel, and you can see the shedding of vortices. But if you look at a, um, you know, a biomechanics application, this is a bifurcated carotid artery that Steve was showing us in the first part of the presentation. You can actually analyze, in this case, the total fluid velocity under pulsatile flow. And you can also look at other things of interest, even though this is a cross-section of, of this 3D mesh. You can also analyze uh, the uh, the shear stress, and then you can compare the response for the fluid pressure at various locations shown here, as well as the wall shear stress. You can compare it to other uh, CFD software that's out there showing very good. Here is the maximum shear stress that you can see at this location. So this is a fluid flowing through a rigid domain. This domain doesn't deform. So then later we decided we wanted to also implement fluid flow over in a deformable domain. So what you see here is an elastic tube that surrounds the fluid domain. So how did we implement this? We implemented this as a fluid structure interaction you know, in 2019. The fluid here is flowing through a mesh which is deformable. So it's almost like a biphasic material except that we purposefully give a very, very low stiffness to the mesh and there's zero resistance between the fluid and the solid mesh. So we model the fluid structure interaction domain as a biphasic mixture, which is very highly specialized. It has zero uh, frictional interactions between the fluid and the solid. And the solid has negligible mass, negligible, has, has zero mass, negligible stiffness. So if you look at this simulation, then you can see that a pressurized fluid will actually inflate the tube and the fluid will flow through. So this is a, the fluid structure interaction module. And here is a you know, biological application. So here again, this is the uh, bifurcated carotid artery. And in this particular case, we've added now the arterial wall. The arterial wall is modeled with a nonlinear pulse alpha gas or Ogden material model, which is available in FeBio. And here, this just demonstrates how you um, face a conundrum about what boundary conditions to impose when you actually have a deformable uh, you know, solid matrix as well. In this particular case, we applied a very simple boundary condition where we fixed all the ends. You could argue that's not very physiological. So what if you decide to only fix the inlet, see what happens to the outlet? It's even worse. Why? Because we have dynamic effects. So this analysis runs until this point, And then due to the kinking that you see here, the analysis will fail. 
So then we decided to embed the car carotid artery in, in fat tissue the way it really is in the body. And we only fixed the inlet. And now with the HGO material model, the behavior is very good. You don't get this you know, snapping behavior that you see here because the fatty tissue is able to um, you know, control that motion. And here, if you use a simple Mooney Rivlin material, it inflates a lot more than the HGO because there are no fibers. It's a non-realistic material model, but it once again illustrates the ability to have a deformable solid domain that contains the fluid flow. So now what is a biphasic fluid structure interaction module? We introduced this this year. And basically what you have now is the fluid domain, which previously was, was modeled as a specialized idealized case of a biphasic domain with like zero friction between the fluid and the solid and negligible stiffness. Well, you don't have to do any of these things. You don't have to neglect the stiffness of the solid matrix through which the fluid is moving. You can actually create a biphasic domain where the fluid has viscosity and you include the dynamic effects. Now, this is an axisymmetric model that simulates like, a, let's say like a, a, the heart. And what you have here is we created a biphasic uh, FSI domain right at the inlet and right at the outlet. And we use the permeability of the domain to control whether the inlet is open or closed and whether the outlet is open or closed. So I'm gonna show you this simulation in a second. What we have is initially both the inlet and the outlet are open. So fluid that's entering here will flow through and exit, but then we're gonna shut down by reducing the permeability here down to a very low value, almost zero. We're gonna shut down the outlet. And what you're gonna see is the fluid is gonna fill up the chamber here. And then we're gonna reopen the outlet while at the same time closing the inlet as though we had valves, one-way valves, but we're not modeling the valves explicitly. We're using this biphysic fluid structure interaction model to simulate that. So you see here, initially the fluid flows through, then suddenly we shut down this end, we inflate, and then we open again. And we repeat it a second time, and we repeat it a third time just to make sure everything's running correctly. So this gives you an idea of how the biphysic fluid structure interaction uh, module can be used. But of course, there's a more uh, straightforward application, which is to also say, well, I want to model the blood flow through this um, artery, but I also want to take into account that the arterial wall is permeable to uh, maybe the water you know, component of the blood. So in this particular model, we exaggerated the permeability of the arterial wall to help you see it. So what you see is that, in fact, we're only showing the arrows that represent the fluid flow in the wall, but the blood domain, of course, has much faster fluid velocity flowing through it. But this blood flow is due to the pressurization to the blood pressure. And you can see that as the blood pressure pulses, you can see the, uh, the arterial wall expanding, though the fluid flow doesn't change a whole lot. And then this is the mass flow rate that's calculated. This is the mass flow rate through the wall. If we put an unrealistically high permeability for the arterial wall. But if we put a realistic permeability, of course, then there's hardly any fluid that flows through it. But this now illustrates to you this biphasic fluid structure interaction module in FMO. And then the last thing I want to talk about is something that we added just you know, uh, recently, which is the ability to model plasticity in FEBio. So like everything else that we do in FEBio, we uh, try to replicate the classical fields of mechanics, but in the context of mixture theory, because the mixture theory is the underlying framework, theoretical framework for our multiphysics approach to mechanics. So in this particular case, what we do is we say that an elastic material is made up of intact bonds. And then if you actually load it sufficiently, uh, sufficiently high stress, these intact bonds are going to yield and they're gonna form a yielded bonds. So this is a reactive process. That's why we call this reactive plasticity. So what's different between the intact and the yielded bonds? They don't have the same reference configurations. The bonds that were intact, that they broke and reformed in a stress state. And those new bonds, the yielded bonds have a new reference configuration. So here is, if you want a stress strain response on the horizontal axis, it's the deformation gradient is put here as a representation for the strain. On the vertical axis, this is the Cauchy stress. But what we're going to say is, initially, we have a linear response until, let's say, the von Mises stress or some other yield criterion is exceeded. What happens then is this, those intact bonds yield, and they form new bonds during this you know, short time interval. 
And then when you unload these, what you see is they have a different reference configuration. So whereas this is the total deformation gradient at the end of the loading, right? Then what you can do is you can decompose this total deformation gradient. Um, I'm sorry, this is a total deformation gradient. This here is only the part that's uh, due to the you know, intact bonds and this is the plastic you know, deformation. So that's what we've implemented. I'm gonna skip through the rest of the theoretical details, but I'm gonna show you how the results of the FE bio simulations compare well to experimental data. So this is what we call a cylindrical billet, which can be forged into a ball bearing. And this is done with this process that you see in the simulation here. So then the forging process you know, is a contact analysis and the cylinder turns into a sphere. And when you actually take the experimental data for the force needed to do the forging, it agrees very well with the simulation until the very last step here. This could be due simply to the fact that we assume frictionless contact when in reality, there should be some friction. These are experimental data from Xi et al. The same authors also did what we call upsetting of a cylindrical billet where you compress a cylinder, a cylindrical billet and it starts bulging out laterally, but you prevent the bulging all the way at the bottom. So this is the simulation here. So when you do the simulation, you can see actually, you know, the, the upsetting of the cylindrical billet. And once again, the dark curve is the FE bio, you know, response and the uh, symbols represent the experimental data showing very good agreement for the plasticity. In addition to plasticity, we can also do elastoplastic damage. So you can actually go a little bit beyond classical plasticity and you can say, look, uh, eventually, you know that when you deform a material and you undergo plastic deformation like a metal, eventually it's going to break. And so can we simulate that you know, uh, damage that's caused by you know, the, the material breaking apart? The answer is yes, we have already the ability to do elastic damage in FE bio where intact bonds and of an elastic material can break without undergoing any plasticity. Or we can also have now, if we include yielded bonds in our mixture, these yielded bonds can also break. We call this plastic damage. This is an axisymmetric model for uniaxial tension of a bar. Uniaxial tension of a bar will usually lead to the necking of the bar. This is only a wedge uh, model that's symmetric. So this is going to be the region that's going to neck as we elongate in the vertical direction. And A0 is the initial radius of the bar. So this is the center line along here. So what I'm going to show you now is, you know, as you actually expand the bar, you can see actually the necking that's taking place. And we need to decide at what point do these yielded bonds undergo damage? When do they break? And the answer is we're going to pick, instead of the von Mises stress, we're going to pick the octahedral plastic strain as, a, as the uh, damage variable, if you want the, the, the variable that determines when the damage is going to take place. So this necking behavior that you see is characteristic of uniaxial loading. Now we're going to look at how the damage is evaluated. The damage is not just proportional to the octahedral plastic strain. It's a nonlinear function of the octahedral plastic strain. In this particular case, it'll get damaged all the way right here at the bottom. Now let's compare this to experimental data. A over A0 is the necking radius over the initial radius of the bar. And the symbols are experimental data from the paper by Norris et al. And the yellow curve is just the reactive plasticity framework. And if we add damage to it, you can see that it actually can predict the experimental response a little bit better. Because if you don't allow for damage of the yielded bonds, eventually you get the stiffening effect that you see. And this is the normalized total load. Once again, if you don't allow for damage, then eventually your plasticity response deviates from the experimental data. But if you allow for damage, you can actually replicate the experimental response. So, and as a final illustration of the same problem, this time I'm gonna show you the whole bar. But once again, we only did a wedge axisymmetric analysis, but I'm using two features in FE Bio and FE Bio Studio. In FE Bio, I'm gonna use a feature called element erosion, which says I'm gonna get rid of when the elements, when the damage exceeds a certain threshold, let's say 95% damage, I want the elements to simply disappear from the mesh. So we're gonna use that. You're gonna see that when the, the bar actually next, it's gonna break, then the elements are gonna disappear from the mesh. And then I'm using a 
in FE Bio Studio a feature to reflect the geometry so you can see the whole bar, not just the axis symmetric model. Now let me run the simulation for you. You're gonna see that the bar is elongating and it's gonna start necking here. And then the damage is gonna start increasing. And when it starts, when it exceeds a particular threshold, eventually the elements are going to break and they disappear. And in order for the recoil to actually solve, I'm gonna run this again one more time. What you saw is some elements disappeared and suddenly the material recoiled. The only way you can actually simulate this recoil is to actually uh, use a dynamic analysis. Otherwise, FEBio will fail to converge once some of the elements got damaged. So I'll show you this one last time and then I'll return uh, the slide back to Steve. So you can watch it carefully. You can see that once it breaks, it's gonna recoil and that recoil was due to a dynamic effect. Very good. So these are the three new features we introduced in FEBio in FE and FEBio Studio this year. And now I'm gonna get back to uh, Steve, who's going to wrap up this presentation. Go ahead, Steve. So thank you, Gerard. Uh, before we wrap up, I would like to say thanks to the entire FE Bio team for all the great work that they've done in making FE Bio into the great software that it has become. Um, I would also would like to acknowledge our NIH funding. So the FE Bio project has been funded by the NIH since 2009. Of course, we're very grateful for that and we hope that they will continue to fund FE Bio into the future. And then I'd also like to thank the audience for participating in this workshop today. If you have any more questions on FE Bio, there are a few ways to get in touch with us. So you can reach us via email at info at febio.org. So you can also go to our website, febio.org, where you will find all the downloads and uh, manuals and also a link to our forum, which is also a great way to get in touch with us and to ask FEBio, uh, to ask questions not only to us, but also to the entire FEBio community. Then also a reminder that FEBio uh, is open source, so you can just go to GitHub and download the software uh, yourself if you're interested in that. You can also use the GitHub page to uh, post any bug, bugs you may have found or to post any feature requests. So just go to the issues tab on the GitHub website to do that. And then finally, if, uh, if you'd like to stay up to date on news related to FE Bio, then I invite you to uh, follow us on Twitter using the at uh, FE Bio software handle and so with that said, thanks again for participating in this workshop and we'll be happy to answer any questions now.